Being together is more than standing side by side. Being together is about moving forward and helping each other to achieve the same goal, knowing that what you do here can make a difference there. Because if cancer knows no borders, neither do we. When it comes to helping, the kilometers disappear. No matter what the distance, we're together for something bigger, life. Let's team up for cancer research. Join us on September 24th on World Cancer Research Day and help us to increase the survival rate. Welcome and thank you for joining us today as we celebrate World Cancer Research Day on this 24th of September. We are teaming up for cancer research and coming together to talk about collaborative cancer research and the impact of COVID-19 on cancer research. It is my pleasure to be your host today. We are very honored to have Her Majesty, the Queen Leticia, presenting this event together with the Spanish Minister of Science, Pedro Duque, the General Secretary of, State of Research, uh, Rafael Rodrigo, and the President of the Spanish Association Against Cancer, Ramon Reyes. I would also like to introduce our wonderful lineup of speakers. From Maryland, USA, Ms. Nelvis Castro, from California, USA, Dr. Tony Rivas. From North Carolina, USA, Dr. Satish Gopal. From Oxford University, uh, United Kingdom, David Kerr. From Manchester, UK, Dr. Caroline Dive. From Lyon, France, Dr. Elizabeth Waiterpass. And from Valencia, Spain, Dr. Andres Cervantes. I am very pleased that we have almost 1,000 guests from around the globe joining us today on this virtual World Cancer Research Day. And now it is my honor to invite Her Majesty the Queen of Spain, Honorary President of the Spanish Association Against Cancer, to introduce this event. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, everyone. Just, just a few words, Minister, Secretary General, researchers. Well, Ramon, ¿qué tal? Buenas tardes. Good evening. Good tardes. And thanks to everyone for taking part in the World Cancer Research Day, an open dialogue organized by the Spanish Association Against Cancer, with which, with which you will put into the agenda and lay out the priorities on cancer research for the coming years. Needless to say that the backbone of your discussions might well be COVID-19, its impact on research activity, and the reality by which cancer patients are clearly facing its consequences. I don't think I need to get into further detail. We are all going to listen to you very carefully today in order to strengthen the very challenging and powerful idea these days that collaborative, networked, international and comprehensive research is indeed essential for success. Sharing knowledge generously is no longer an option, but a dire necessity. Thank you all again, and uh, my deepest gratitude to the AECC for bringing us all together today. Thank you very much, Marta. You can now take it from here. Thank you very much, Her Majesty. It's always your support is wonderful, and we have all, for those five years, it has been extremely necessary, your, your support. We are certainly living unusual times, but there are very important things that we have learned over the last months. Firstly, the power of science to help us understand the unknown. Secondly, the importance of the collaboration and working together to get better and faster results. And thirdly, how this has changed how we work and how we meet. And it has even given us the opportunity to run this online event. Cancer is one of the biggest global challenges. It's the second leading cause of death worldwide. So no individual researcher or organization has the expertise or ability to tackle alone cancer. Collaboration is crucial if we want to defeat cancer. Five years ago, 10 leading organizations in the global fight against cancer came together to create the World Declaration for Cancer Research and to establish the 24th of September as a day to raise awareness towards the need to support cancer research. We all shared the belief in the power of science to transform the, the cancer outcomes. Today is a day for all of us, the global research community, the partners, funders, and the patients all to come together with a shared vision. Let's team up to beat cancer. 
I may now give the floor to the director of the International Agency for Cancer Research and member of the EU Mission Cancer Board, Dr. Elizabeth Waderpass. Thank you very much, Dr. Waderpass, for your commitment on global cancer prevention and for being here today. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Her Majesty, Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Secretary General, Authorities, Representatives of Civil and Learned Societies, their colleagues and friends. Good afternoon. Can I have please my first slide? Partially inspired by the Apollo 11 mission to put a man on the, to the moon, the European Research and Innovation Missions aim to deliver solutions to some of the greatest challenges of our world face, cancer. Conquering cancer is an integral part of the Horizon Europe Framework Programme that starts in 2021. Cancer is an umbrella term for more than 200 diseases that have in common the uncontrolled growth and spread of the ab abnormal body cells, affecting different tissues and organs. Cancer represents a tremendous burden for patients, for families, and for societies at large. Next slide, please. Cancer is a growing challenge for Europe. Cancer will affect every other man and one in three women during their lifetime in most European countries. There are more than four million new cancer cases diagnosed in Europe every year. The most diagnosed cancers being breast, colorectal, lung cancer. Almost 2 million people die prematurely from cancer in Europe every year, mainly from lung, colorectal and breast cancers. We know that many of these cancers are preventable by the modification of lifestyle factors such as smoking, overweight and obesity, physical inactivity, alcohol and unhealthy diets. Many of these cancers can be diagnosed in premalignant states by screening. When a cancer is detected earlier, treatment is easier and prognostic usually better than the cancer is diagnosed in later stages. Next slide, please. Considering that Europe has a quarter of all cancer cases and less than 10% of the world population, cancer is considered as one of the five major societal challenges in Europe. The number of new cancer cases diagnosed is projected to increase by 25% in Europe by 2035. If we don't act now, this will be an even more serious problem for all European uh, citizens. Next slide, please. Europe needs better, more equitable prevention and diagnosis and treatment and care and support for survivors to improve their quality of life. The Cancer Mission Board members have worked very hard to, to provide to all stakeholders in Europe, to politicians, managers, professionals, citizens, patients and caregivers, the best possible answer to conquering cancer as a mission possible. A mission in the area of cancer that will help set a common goals aiming to reverse these frightening trends in cancer. By joining efforts across Europe, more people would live without cancer. More cancer patients would be diagnosed earlier, would suffer less and have a better quality of life after treatment. The aim of the cancer mission is to provide more prevention, better treatment, leading to more lives saved and to contribute to better quality of life for patients and their families living with and after cancer. The mission has a time frame of 10 years to achieve the goal of saving more than 3 million lives through prevention, earlier and better diagnosis and care, and to contribute to more people living longer and better by 2030. Next slide, please. The cancer mission draft was handled yesterday to the European Commission and is available in their website. The draft represents a common vision for what the mission should achieve and how it could be done. We propose five intervention areas. The first is understanding better the causes of cancer, 
understanding better why some rare cancer happens and understanding better why some cancers are not treated by drugs today. And this is something that, of course, we have to invest in, in all over Europe and to uh, also to, to raise our perspectives to make new, new discoveries. The second priority is preventing the preventable. Of course, preventing cancer is not only a matter of health, it's also a matter of economy and of social behavior. We want to help politicians and governments to take the best decisions to prevent cancer, reducing risk factors and improving lifestyle for all European citizens, and understanding better why, even if we know that eating too much, not practicing physical activity, drinking too much alcohol and smoking tobacco is something that is going to cause cancer sooner or later or other health problems, people will still don't modify their behaviors. We want to improve diagnosis and treatment. We understand that this has an incredible range in Europe, ranging from some of the best possible care, best possible diagnose, best possible treatment, but still, to many people in Europe, some of this is not accessible. So equity and equitable access is a serious challenge for us in Europe, and we have to improve these aspects. We have produced 13 recommendations for bold European actions. Recommendations that in some cases provide the possibility for funding programs through competitive calls for research and other areas. But the mission is not only research. The mission is support to member states, support to individual citizens to improve their lives. So our recommendations range from prevention to diagnose and treatment to quality of life to equitable actions. There has to be a serious interaction between the different departments of the Commission. Europeans beating cancer plan is another opportunity and we are working together with all the directorates in the European Commission to make this a reality. Cancer can be conquered and we will conquer it in Europe. Next slides, please. So to conclude, I would like to say that the COVID-19 pandemic is a wake-up call that more preventive actions are needed. There are two important lessons for the pandemic to underline this. Namely, no point in time is too early to invest in prevention and research. And prevention is less costly than treatment. So I will open to back to the speakers, uh, to the, and the organizers, with the possibility for questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wedepas. It has been an amazing lecture about the future of cancer, especially in Europe. And now let's proceed with the next part and the roundtable moderator of the discussion that would be the Deputy Director of the Communications, U.S. National Cancer Institute, Ms. Nalvis Castro. Ms. Nalvis Castro has been serving for over 30 years at the NCI Communications Department, and one of her passions is international collaboration. She has been one of our strongest uh, supporters for World Cancer Research Day, and I'm delighted that she's here with, with us today. Thank you very much for your involvement. We would appreciate if you could send us your questions through the chat or through YouTube, and we will uh, try to answer as much as possible at the end of the event. Thank you very much, Ms. Castro. Thank you, Martha, for the warm welcome, and thank you to all of you for joining us today, for your participation and commitment. World Cancer Research Day started as a small idea between a few passionate colleagues. In only a few short years, World Cancer Research Day has transformed into an international campaign and a powerful global partnership. Today is an important day to raise awareness about the unsung heroes of cancer research and those who team up to enable global advances in science, and many others who day in and day out play a critical role in improving the lives of all cancer patients. An extraordinary movement has been started, and it is up to all of us to amplify the message and encourage others to join these efforts. Cancer is a crucial conversation in the world today. 
cancer cases are increasing, death rates are increasing. And communicating and raising awareness about cancer research is vital to our collective efforts. It allowed us to tell the story of cancer research and the relevance of cancer research to public health, to governments, and most importantly, to patients and the general. Today, I would like to welcome Dr. Carolyn Dive, Dr. Andres Cervantes, and Dr. Anthony Rivas to the first portion of this 2020 World Cancer Research Day virtual roundtable. The focus of this session will be on international collaborations and initiatives. Dr. Dive is the president of the European Association for Cancer Research and deputy director of the Cancer Research UK Manchester Institute and is our first speaker. Dr. Dive has a great track record in collaborative research and is the leading principal investigator of several international networks. Dr. Dive for this networks and funding schemes for researchers to go beyond boundaries. Additionally, Thank now you. that many research, many research teams and are very multidisciplinary, we will explain the dynamics of having experts from different fields working together towards the same goal. Next will be Dr. Andres Cervantes, President-elect of the European Society for Medical Oncology. The Scientific Weekend of ESMO's 2020 Virtual Congress has just concluded with great success. And Dr. Cervantes will share some highlights of the meeting and where clinical cancer research is heading. Dr. Cervantes will also share some highlights around international collaborations in clinical research cases, particularly in cancers with low incidence. And we will end the first portion of the roundtable discussion with, with Dr. Anthony Rivas, president of the American Association for Cancer Research. Dr. Rivas will share some highlights of AACR's just released annual cancer progress report 2020, and we'll also discuss how cancer research has been affected by the pandemic. And now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Dive. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here on World Cancer Research Day and to represent the EACR, which is a community of basic and translational researchers from more than 100 countries. We're hugely supportive of collaborations across Europe and beyond. I'm very excited about our partnership with the AACR. And I think it's just so important how international collaborations crucially bring folks together who think about a really large problem, which is tackling cancer. Think about it from different directions with different skills so we can share our knowledge and be at the cutting edge of what is doable right now with a view to what needs to be developed in our research to really take our research forward in the future. We, we don't want to duplicate efforts. We want to synergize our skills and expertise so that we can make real progress. So, so funding for international collaborations is, is really very crucial. And I think if we want to translate our basic science, discoveries that are made about cancer biology, for example, to, to the clinic with the utility to change and improve outcomes for patients, we sometimes have to do very large and very expensive experiments and we generate enormous data sets. So I think that you know, the real challenges for the few in our international collaborations are the early detection of cancer and personalizing a cancer patient's treatment. So I thought I would give you a couple of examples of these really fantastic international collaborations. And the first one that I'm excited about is just been announced. It's called EU Can Image. Um, it's funded by the European Commission, 10 million euros over the next four years, and it brings together more than 20 research institutions across Europe and the United States of America. 
The idea is to take imaging data from 250,000 cancer individuals and to put that imaging data together with other data sets and clinical correlates and to develop a holistic view of a patient's cancer um, and a fingerprint, really, of their cancer so that we might be able to detect small lesions, perhaps cancer metastasis in the liver or subtype uh, types of breast cancer, for example. And these enormous data sets, these, these big teams that we put together in this international collaboration will develop artificial intelligence methodology that will really allow us to interpret this data. And the idea, of course, is to really tailor treatment for each individual patient as we go forward. The ACR will play a role in disseminating the results from this incredible consortium. So that's one example. The second example I wanted to give you today is one that I, I run in the UK. It's funded by Cancer Research UK. It's called an Accelerator Award. It gives £5 million over five years to phase one clinical trial centres around the UK and in Spain and in Italy. So it brings those phase one clinical trials centers together. And what we're trying to do, and, and the consortium is called UpSmart. So we're going to be testing digital devices, point of care. So patients will make measurements in their own homes. We're going to develop software that will visualize all the multiple data points that come from a phase one trial and make that data much more accessible to the treating physicians in a much more rapid turnaround way and involve the patients themselves as investigators in their own clinical trial. So the discovery about how to do that, how to digitize clinical trials won't just be uh, kept to one centre, all of that knowledge will be shared around, around Europe uh, for the clinical trials of the future. So highly, highly exciting, I think. And you asked about the multidisciplinary nature of science today and cancer research. And I think this is also really, really critical going forward. And people from different disciplines are taught to think differently. And when you put those folks together in one programme, you learn from each other. You learn to speak each other's languages, which are a little different. My language in biology is different from a bioengineer, for example. And we want to bring these multidisciplinary teams together. And one of the really good examples here is, is something like the early detection of lung cancer. We know that if we can detect lung cancer early, we can really transform outcomes for patients. But you need a cancer biologist to model the early facets of disease biology. You need a translational scientist to develop the liquid biopsies, the circulating free DNA or the CTCs. You need the respiratory physicians or pulmonologists who are the medical experts uh, at the front line with the patient. You need the radiologist to interpret the logo CT scans of the thorax. You need the statisticians and the epidemiologists to help you design that screening trial. You need experts in public engagement to get folks really involved and come forward for screening. And you need nanotechnicians and bioengineers to make the tests more sensitive whilst maintaining specificity. And then you need the health economists to make it all somehow affordable. So the real skill here is pulling all those folks. I think I named 10 different disciplines and they all work together for the early detection of lung cancer. That's just one example of how multidisciplinary science is so important now and in the future as we, we tackle cancer going forward. And I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Dive. Uh, Dr. Cervantes, we, you're next, please continue. Well, um, I would like to uh, um, comment a bit on uh, the last ESMO Congress uh, key message this year uh, is uh, bringing innovation to cancer patients. And uh, innovation in oncology has uh, to move outside of the conventional boundaries um, and has to be brought into clinical practice reaching uh, cancer patients. ESMO uh, uh, brought together uh, last week the oncology community with more than 30,000 uh, uh, participants through the ESMO Congress. This year was in a virtual format due to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And while um, we have recently concluded the Science Weekend, we are re already uh, uh, ready for the upcoming Education Weekend, where doctors can learn how to apply in practice uh, the, latest, the latest results that come out of uh, effort of uh, research. 
Um, uh, I, I would like also to understand that we've got um, important advances uh, coming from the more than 2,000 uh, abstract scientific communications that were presented in, in the Congress. In a communication perspective, it's also impressive to say that we've reached almost 150 um, million Twitter impression ar around the, the the Congress, which is uh, uh, which made you idea of how interactive and how um, uh, the Congress was. Uh, what we've learned uh, during the Congress is that um, uh, immunotherapy uh, is going beyond lung cancer, and this is a very positive uh, thing, and it's coming to more common diseases. Uh, we had an historical presidential session with four abstract changing standard of care for gastroesophageal cancer. I have to say, for example, in the role of uh, a treatment uh, for advanced esophageal cancer, there were no new drugs in the last uh, uh, 40 years, particularly for uh, squamous uh, uh, tumors. So uh, we've learned also how to combine targeted therapies, immunotherapies. Also, um, we are starting to receive um, outcomes of trials, not only in metastatic disease, but also in localized disease, where the hope is to get uh, more cures uh, for these uh, for the for these uh, uh, patients. So uh, I would like also to underline the importance of precision medicine, um, which is impacting a lot in 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 oncology, not only and at the diagnostic level, but also at the therapeutical one. Um, and globally, I think uh, uh, this uh, Congress uh, brought us a lot of hope. And uh, uh, next step is to try um, to um, bring uh, all cancer patients in an equality manner, all the um, possibilities, all the uh, drugs that could be available for them is strongly committed to achieve uh, this uh, aim. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cervantes. And now uh, we uh, would like to invite Dr. Rivas. You're next. Thank you very much, Dr. Castro. Uh, Su Majestad, the Senor Ministro, Dr. Apuyol. I, it's an honor to be here with my friends, Caroline Dive, and my friend and, and former professor, uh, Andres Cervantes. Uh, I'm representing the American Association for Cancer Research, or ACR, which is the, the largest and world's first uh, uh, organization dedicated to cancer research, has over uh, 47,000 uh, members and represents 127 uh, countries. We just released the Cancer Progress Report, which is the 10th edition of a document that collects the advances in the last one year. Um, if we look back, the first edition of the Cancer Progress Report 10 years ago, there were only three new drugs approved for the treatment of cancer. This year, there's 20 new drugs approved, uh, and 15 others where the labels have been um, uh, uh, expanded to other cancer indications. The pace of turning science into treatments, it's unparalleled. Um, we're making progress in so many areas because of what my colleagues have described, which is the revolution on the understanding of cancer genetics, opening molecularly targeted therapies that are allowing even rare cancers to have to be matched uh, to specific treatments. And the parallel revolution on the understanding of how the immune system can attack cancer, either by releasing its breaks or by genetically modifying the immune system and giving it back to patients. Now we have immunotherapies that are uh, indicated not only based by where in the, uh, where in the body the cancer uh, raises, but what's the genetic makeup of that cancer. And if it has certain characteristics that lead to higher mutational load, these agents are um, approved across um, 
multiple histologies. Um, this into a lot of benefit for patients, uh, but also benefits for society. And if we look at how did we get here, we got here by the investment in such turning into treatments. And we can trace it back to the 1970s, 1960s, where fundamental knowledge about biology was developed that has been enhanced in probably a logarithmic scale in the last several decades, allowing us a very refined understanding of what is a cancer. Why are cancers so different from each other despite presenting from uh, similar parts of the body? And how can we uh, find its vulnerabilities and develop treatments? The investment in the United States uh, into the uh, National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute has been unparalleled uh, for any other place in the world. And the number of drugs that we can trace to research that's been funded by taxpayers' money, uh, could uh, it's uh, probably covering the majority of these new approvals. My big pledge here is that investment in science reverts to a lot of benefits for society. It's not only the impressive cases that we have of patients being treated with the right drugs and doing well long-term, children, adults, elderly people that are matched with the right treatment, but also how this enterprise is becoming a, a source of economic growth, of entrepreneurship, of creating new companies and new drugs that are employing more people, that are returning with higher, much higher dividends, the investment of taxpayers' money put into research. So I hope this model is taken on throughout the world. It makes the world better when we understand science better, when we treat our patients better, and we, when we develop effective drugs, which is what's been happening in the last several years, and it's captured by the Cancer Progress Report. I also want to uh, uh, highlight that ACR last week released the first ACR Cancer Disparities Progress Report. That is a parallel document that was focused on the uh, people who are not being benefiting from all of these advances with the healthcare disparities, both racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic. We need to reach everybody. It's unacceptable that not everybody benefits from, this be uh, from these advances. And we need to look at the root causes of these, which arise from socioeconomic dis uh, disparities, but also by structural racism that has been embedded in many societies, including the U.S. society, where certain uh, parts of the population have not had the same access to education, to housing, and to health care. And that leads to that part of the society not being able to raise the same students or the others. They're not starting on the same playing field. And that is unacceptable. The recent events in the U.S. highlight that society will not tolerate this anymore. And I think it's our mandate as leaders of professional societies, even in cancer research, to look into healthcare disparities, to look into racial injustices, and to work actively to correct them. So this is a great day to highlight the progress. It's also a great day to say that we need to invest in ourselves because we're demonstrating progress, but that we need to reach all society and benefit everybody equally. Thank you, Dr. Rivas. I totally agree with you. Now we're going to uh, move to the second part of our uh, program, uh, which will focus on the impact of COVID-19 on cancer research. You will hear from Dr. Satish Kopal, Director of the U.S. Cancer Institute's Center for Global Health, 
Dr. Rivas uh, will join us again, and we'll end with Dr. David Kerr, a professor at Oxford University and representing today the American Association for Clinical Oncologists. Greetings to all. Our first speaker, Dr. Sanjay Kopal, will briefly describe the effect of the pandemic on cancer control at the population level worldwide, including in low and middle income countries. He will also discuss opportunities for innovation in cancer control and research worldwide that have in that have resulted from the pandemic. Dr. Anthony Rivas will um, share some highlights of the AACR COVID-19 Task Force and the AACR COVID-19 and Cancer Virtual Meetings, two initiatives set up during the early days of the pandemic. And Dr. David Kerr will discuss whether SARS-CoV-2 has, has had an effect on cancer control in the clinic, as well as Oxford University's efforts in leading the research in one of the most promising vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. Dr. Kerr will share some insights on the path and the timeline to a viable vaccine and the potential effect of the vaccine in cancer patients. After today's presentation, we'll have a few minutes for some questions, which can be submitted through the chat at the bottom right of your screen. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Gopal for the next presentation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nelvis. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in today's event, celebrating the importance of cancer research. We celebrate this day while, of course, still under the cloud of COVID, whose effects on cancer control and research are being felt worldwide. Some of you may have seen a recent editorial in Science by the director of the U.S. National Cancer Institute, Dr. Ned Sharpless, in which colleagues from the Cancer Intervention and Surveillance Modeling Network estimated nearly 10,000 excess colorectal and breast cancer deaths over the next decade from COVID-19 related disruptions in the United States. Moreover, these projections almost certainly underestimate effects of the pandemic on cancer control as they assume modest and time limited disruptions to routine services and examined only two common cancer sites. Taking a more global view, while similar modeling efforts are ongoing worldwide, the data to inform such models are simply not as good yet for places like Sub-Saharan Africa, where I spent all my academic and professional life as an oncologist and cancer researcher before joining the National Cancer Institute. Indeed, healthcare infrastructure in many low and middle income countries was insufficient to meet cancer control needs even before COVID-19. A recent survey of countries by the World Health Organization found disruptions in cancer services in 42% of countries and in 55% of countries where there was ongoing community transmission of COVID. Importantly, this survey was conducted in May before COVID cases really began to escalate in many low and middle income countries. So while we will learn more, it is clear that COVID effects on cancer control worldwide are likely to be profound and long lasting and an ongoing challenge for the global cancer community for years to come. Economic consequences of COVID are also already having a marked impact on the diverse community of international cancer research funders with nonprofit organizations, particularly predicting substantial losses of income this year. Many and we are aware of several instances where global cancer research initiatives specifically have suffered as a result of these funding shortfalls. But even as we strive to cope with COVID and look forward to the pandemic being controlled, we are also hopeful that this immense worldwide disruption will provide lessons and opportunities to improve ways in which cancer services have historically been delivered. As just one example, COVID has had marked effects on cancer screening in the US. Data from the Epic Health Research Network indicate that although the number of weekly screenings for breast, colon, and cervical cancer as of June were recovering, they were still not back to pre-pandemic levels. And there was a substantial deficit of missed screenings that will still need to be addressed. 
To be more specific, approximately 420,000 screenings were missed for the sites over a three-month period. These problems have drawn significant media attention in the United States, and importantly, have also galvanized efforts to not just return to pre-pandemic norms, but to innovate, to deliver more equitable patient and community-centered cancer screening. For example, there are renewed calls to accelerate efforts to approve self-collection for human papillomavirus testing as a method for cervical cancer screening in the US, which would allow women to undergo screening on their own schedules in their own homes, rather than visiting a doctor in a hospital for a cytology test. Comparable efforts to innovate and investigate new ways to deliver cancer services that more equitably reach the populations that need them are being similarly pursued through increased clinical trial flexibilities and widespread use of telehealth, all of which can increase access and reduce burden for patients and providers, making it easier for them to participate in cancer research and help us accelerate progress. Such efforts are ongoing worldwide, and the U.S. National Cancer Institute is deeply engaged in these initiatives across cancer sites, disciplines, geographies, and resource levels. So even as we remain in the midst of some still dark COVID clouds, I believe these efforts will yield some silver linings for cancer research and control that we have long been seeking. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Rivas. Dr. Rivas, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Castro. It's great to go after Dr. Gopal. Um, uh, all of the points that he has raised are, I believe, the, some of the most important to build up in this period uh, uh, of this pandemic. When the pandemic first hit, it was clear that we all had to adapt to it. We all, all had to contribute. And it also it forced us to change many of the things that were done for a long time in one way. Uh, to start doing them differently. Uh, the ACR, uh, uh, we created uh, the COVID and Cancer Task Force, um, a group of academicians, uh, industry experts, uh, people from government, uh, from the FDA, from, uh, from the NIH and the, and the NCI, uh, to allow to provide guidance and leadership uh, on how do we adapt to this unprecedented pandemic. One of the first things we had to do is to change how our society was doing things. Uh, we were planning um, an in-person meeting in April in in, uh, in San Diego. It was going to be the most the, 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 the largest and most successful ACR meeting ever. And we had to turn it virtual. And within three weeks, we uh, put together the first uh, merger international um, uh, meeting uh, to our surprise, we had a great surprise, but also planning. We had 61,000 people joining. And if we had the second virtual meeting, because we couldn't put all of the program in, into, a, into a one virtual meeting, we had 100,000 registrants connecting, uh, telling us that people are interested in continuing to advance, continue to address science. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic also made us look inwards on what's happening to patients with cancer and how can we continue to provide care. As Dr. Gopal said, um, there was an 85% decrease in screening procedures, uh, that, uh, uh, procedures that have been proven to benefit patients. There was 80% uh, uh, of the patients in the first months had disruptions of their care. They didn't get treatments, surgeries, uh, or, uh, or sc uh, scans that, they were, that were planned. And there was a 75% decrease in the clinical trial participation. But in a, a remarkable short period of time, the hospitals, the clinics, and the research laboratories have adapted. We have implemented telehealth, which allows patients not to come to the visit uh, to the clinic in person and be able to do um, visits by, by uh, video conferencing something that was technically feasible, but probably would have taken years to implement. And it was implemented in a matter of weeks in many places. Um, we've got uh, improvements in clinical trial conduct, uh, 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 con uh, remote consenting, providing ho uh, home 
treatments, sending experimental drugs to patients, helping you uh, uh, to generate the data that will help us improve treatment uh, of cancer tomorrow. Uh, we're still worried about the backlog of the screening tests and how individually it may make sense to decrease individual exposure to COVID-19 by delaying a test, but then uh, all, all of those tests are not diagnosing early the cancers that should have been diagnosed. So we'll continue to work on understanding what's happening and helping advise how to improve it. Um, as we said before, the discrepancies in healthcare uh, have, have even brought into more light during the COVID-19 pandemic because uh, the people who were more vulnerable before and had less uh, access to care for cancer are also the ones that are more vulnerable to COVID-19 for a series of socioeconomic reasons that lead to them. And we have to continue to study them and address them. We're at a time where a pandemic has forced us to change our ways, and we have to build on the positive changes to be able to improve uh, the care for everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rivas. And now uh, we will uh, have Dr. Kerr, who will round up, round up this session. Dr. Kerr, you're next. Thank you very much. Um, Your Majesty, Minister, friends and colleagues, let me bring warm words of welcome from the Dreaming Spars of Oxford. The motto of my university, Dominus Illuminatio Mea, means the Lord is my light. What I hope to be able to demonstrate at the end of this brief talk is that there is indeed light at the end of the COVID tunnel. I think Drs. Gopal and Rivas have said very well and how we as a community have adapted to the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And I do mean the wider community of researchers, of clinicians, uh, of our patients and of wider society. Um, in terms of my own clinical practice, this is my, my clinic. Um, on Friday mornings, I have a visit which I deliver from the kitchen table. Health, um, using a variety of different methodological tools, we can reach out to our patients and, and it works. So even the complexity of breaking bad and difficult news can be done gently and with fidelity and with honour. And, and our patients appreciate that in these difficult times, using modern tools such as telehealth means that we can continue. There's no doubt that there's been a hit to screening and to surgery. Um, in terms of my own practice as a medical oncologist delivering chemotherapy, we have amended, adapted our protocols, uh, and I think we've, we've done so pretty successfully and managed to maintain about 85% delivery of the conventional chemotherapy that we give. And, and there's no doubt that the uh, COVID pandemic, I think as Tony said very well, has speeded up our rate of uh, embracement, our, our adaption to, to new methodologies, and I don't think we'll be going back I think telehealth is here to stay. Um, I think this new way of working will persist way beyond us beating and finishing the, the COVID pandemic. In terms of my own university, I am proud that we are one of the universities which are at the leading edge of COVID research. Um, that, that again involves us as cancer researchers. We're repurposing some of our drugs, which we think might be important in terms of dampening down the immediate um, um, the immediate dangers of COVID, drugs which may prevent the damage to lungs and other body systems in terms of preventing long COVID. Some of our cancer drugs, I am sure, will have a role to play within that wider therapeutic approach to, uh, to COVID. So even as cancer researchers, again, the word adapting, evolving, using our science to be able to work with our, other, um, uh, with, with our other colleagues in Oxford. In terms of the vaccine, this is being delivered and developed by my friends in the Jenner Institute, which actually sits within the, uh, our, our large cancer research building on the uh, North Campus in Oxford. What they're doing is they're using a, a, a very well-described chimpanzee adenovirus. They've disabled it. 
So outside of the laboratory, the virus cannot divide. And very cleverly, they've managed to get the chimpanzee virus to be able to express the part of the COVID virus which is necessary to get it into cells and to cause damage. In the first trial, which has recently been published in The Lancet, they're treating many thousands of patients. They really have shown very promising results indeed of immune stimulation. What we want to see with any new vaccine is, can the body generate high levels of potent the answer is and beyond that, it's very clear that I think what will be a very potent and useful vaccine generates something called T cell responses. So we have the whole spectrum of immune responses generated in response to this um, vaccine. And a small subset of patients, we've now gone on to give a prime and a boost. So by giving two doses of the vaccine, uh, we can see that we greatly amplify the body's immune response. And importantly, we can do this safely. The main side effects have been um, minor muscle aches, a minor temperature, all of which are controlled very adequately by pretreatment with paracetamol. Now, I know there's been some stuff in the news recently um, about a couple of untoward reactions. These have been investigated incredibly thoroughly, as you would imagine, and it doesn't look as if mechanistically they're related directly to the to the vaccine itself, but rather that it was just a, an unfortunate coincidence. Nevertheless, it, it's unquestionably true that um, as many vaccines are being developed in many different countries in the world, it's vitally important that these are done within a situation which is controlled, in which there's good safety um, oversight, and in which we can take a package of results uh, to the regulatory authorities and beyond those to citizens of the world. Because if we undertake a mass vaccination policy, we must ensure that the vaccine works, the immune effects I mentioned earlier, but that it's safe. And so far, so good. Uh, I'm allowed to say that. Um, and in terms of timing, um, um, manufacture, large-scale manufacture of the virus is already being undertaken. And it's quite possible, I'll say possible rather than probable, that it will be ready within the first quarter of next year. The other thing is that the vaccine has been applied across a whole wide um, age range of different individuals. As we get older, our immune system becomes uh, weaker. It, it, it degenerates somewhat. And yet what seems to be the case is that this vaccine is very powerful and promising, even in those patients who have a somewhat immunocompromised. And therefore, again, I would have great hope that this vaccine would be effective for those of our cancer patients who may be immunocompromised through the disease or are sometimes by the drugs and medicines that we use. So, so thanks again for this opportunity to discuss uh, these matters with you. Emerson said that convention was that love of wisdom of coming together and sharing it. And I think this has been a fantastic afternoon of having done so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kerr. Excellent presentations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dive, Dr. Cervantes, Rivas, Gopal, and Kerr for taking time to participate in the 2020 World Cancer Research Virtual uh, Roundtable and for your extremely informative presentations. Let's give our speakers, speakers a virtual round of applause. We will now move uh, to address some of the questions that have been uh, we have been receiving through the chat function. Um, the first questions, question comes from Dr. Uh, Pedro Duque, the Spanish Ministry of um, Science, uh, and this question uh, is for Dr. Kerr. Cancer research has been slowed down somewhat by the pandemic. However, very large resources have been mobilized for vaccine, treatment, and diagnosis of COVID-19. Could could conversely cancer research in some way benefit from expanded COVID-19 investigation? I, I think this is a very important question. Uh, I'm sure Carl and Dai will speak to this. At home, we have a, a, an essentially important cancer charity, CRUK, the biggest cancer charity in the world, and they've taken a major financial hit. 
They're working incredibly hard to maintain income to support tens of thousands of scientists in the UK and throughout Europe. And they're, they're finding it a struggle to get back on par. As more funding and research is correctly moving towards uh, moving towards COVID, I think it is likely and possible that we will learn more about the immunology of the disease. I think we'll learn more about how we can partner and understand um, the, the connections between these different diseases. And as I said earlier, the community of cancer researchers is contributing to developing new drugs, which we hope will be effective for COVID. But, but it will be very interesting to see um, um, if there is a drop in income or a drop in available resources for basic and translational cancer research. It's a worry that many researchers have. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kerr. The second question comes from um, the ECL Secretariat, um, and the question is for Dr. Weatherpass. What are IARC's plans in terms of updating and ensuring the sustainability of the European Union against cancer? I cannot hear. I'm sorry, I, I lost the volume. I'm going to go ahead and move to the third question. I couldn't hear Dr. Weather pass. Um, something went on with the uh, volume or this uh, um, system. Um, the third question is for Dr. Rivas. In the last 10 years, major, major efforts have been concentrated in cancer research, resulting in important results and increased survivor rates. Do you predict that the main results in cancer research in the next 10, do, where do you predict that the main results in cancer research in the next 10 years will come from? Yes, I, I agree that um, we have to continue to improve. Um, the model is working, which is understanding science leads to better treatments. Uh, in the cancer that I treat, this, which is this, uh, an aggressive form of skin cancer called melanoma, when I started 20 years ago, maybe one in 20 patients had any chance, uh, uh, patients with metastatic melanoma spread through the body, only one in 20 had any chance to respond to any of existing therapies. Now, half of my patients are living long term. That is a really remarkable improvement but it's not good enough. There's still 50% that don't do well. There's still 50% where we and I fail to know enough to treat them effectively and give them the benefits of modern therapies. So we have to continue to improve. And the improvement is going to come from investment in science, from developing the right drugs for the right patients because we understood the biology of the cancer that led to better treatments of patients. Um, so I think the next 10 years, we're going to continue to improve, but it requires continued investment. It requires continued scientific um, um, uh, research, uh, innovation, and entrepreneurship. I want to say one last thing, uh, touching on the, the questions that were posed to the uh, 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 in a moment about the parallelisms about COVID-19 and cancer. We're seeing that there's a lot that cancer researchers are providing uh, to, uh, 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 to COVID-19. There's cancer researchers that stop their research and focus to, uh, immediately in COVID-19 because the same process that cancer has of dysregulating uh, proteins and leading to uh, untoward, un unwanted growth and inflammation and avoiding the immune system is what COVID-19 does. And the same 
platforms of analysis and study are being applied equally. And as it was said, there's some cancer drugs that are now being repurposed to treat COVID. So we have a lot to do by helping each other and understand, understanding science better. Great. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, we only have uh, time for only one more question. And this is from the Secretary General for Research, and it is for Dr. Cervantes. Do you think that the challenge to reach 70% reduction of death due to cancer will be possible in 10 years from now? What is really needed to, prog to progress in the right way in this time period, period, and which are the most important measures to be implemented? I think um, that's a very, a very important uh, uh, question, a very important uh, issue we have in, in uh, on the top of our table, and uh, we do believe this is achievable. Uh, I, uh, we do believe in the power of science, in the power of knowledge. We have to work. We have to uh, keep working together. We have to uh, uh, work, as uh, uh, Dr. Dive said in the very beginning of this uh, session, putting together all disciplines, all um, uh, professions that are important to increase our knowledge. If this uh, uh, progressive effect um, that we've got so far um, coming from our better of the understanding of cancer and reaching many dark corners of uh, 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 cancer uh, uh, diseases uh, in the last few years, I think uh, we should uh, look at the future with some hope. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cervantes. Uh, I am told that um, we have time for one more question, and this question is for Dr. Um, Kerr. We are all waiting for the COVID-19 vaccine that hopefully we'll be able to get a hold of by 2021. Do you think that it is a good idea to get vaccinated with a flu vaccine this autumn? Do you think this vaccine gives some immunity to coronavirus? This is a really important public health question. It's very important that we are protected from influenza not because it will protect from the COVID virus, but just there's very good evidence that you can become infected with COVID and influenza. And the double infection hugely increases the death rate. So I'm definitely going to have a flu vaccine. I would recommend that everybody else does because this will protect us, not from, not from developing COVID, but from dying of a double infection if one were so desperately unlucky. So definitely flu vaccine. Wonderful. Thank you for that uh, public health message. Um, so I want to, I would like to uh, end this session and, th and, and again, a big thank to all our speakers and to all of you for joining the event today. Um, teaming up for cancer research through Global collaborations lead to incredible advances in prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of cancer, benefiting cancer patients. So I invite you to visit www.worldcancerresearchday.com for more information and to join the campaign. Thank you very much to all. And now I would like to turn this back to Marta. Hello. Thank you very much, Ms. Castro. It was wonderful with all the speakers that they have shined some light on the current status of cancer research and in the impact of COVID-19. We know that the best way to make a significant progress in cancer is by working all together. To conclude this event, I would like the president of the Spanish Association Against Cancer, Dr. Ramon Reyes, to share a few words with us. Thank you, Marta. Her Majesty, <clears throat> Minister, um, General Secretary, Secretary General, sorry, researchers, uh, dear colleagues and friends. Cancer is one of the biggest social and health problems in the world. In 2018, more than 18 million of new cases of cancer were diagnosed and 9.5 million people died worldwide. Moreover, it is estimated that by 
2030, cancer will be the first cause of death in the world. Our strong commitment is to reduce these figures as much as possible, number of new cases and mortality rate. And this can only be achieved with a strong support to cancer research. Cancer research has saved and is saving thousand, thousands of lives every year. Thanks to research, the survival rate in Spain has grown from 25% in the 50s to 57% today, as per most of the frequent cancers. This progression in survival means saving thousands of lives per year. And this is the reason why cancer research cannot be stopped now. Today, we have been talking about two very important subjects regarding cancer research. First, the worldwide impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in cancer research. And secondly, the importance of the international collaborative research. The COVID-19 pandemic has stopped cancer research worldwide. Both basic research due to the lockdown of research centers and clinical research as most of the hospitals, if not all, were almost exclusively devoted to COVID-19. Nevertheless, there is something positive we have learned from this crisis. And this is that society has now a clear perception about science. Uh, the science has the role key to fight against diseases. We, we all know that solving this pandemic will come from research. And we also know that the only way to get results from research is by making strong capital investments, as well as collab establishing collaborative strategies in order to align international resources. We all hope that the, we'll shortly have uh, vaccines and more effective treatments to put an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. And but there are no miracles in science. To fight cancer, which is the, another silent pandemic, we have to apply the same approach, the same formula that we did for the COVID-19. Huge investment and collaborative research strategies. Cancer research has been stopped by COVID-19 pandemic. And this will have dramatic generational impact and also some direct consequence on cancer patients. We should be able from now on to define and implement specific actions to reinforce cancer research. And this is the only way to improve survival and reduce new cases of cancer at short and medium term. Cancer research cannot be stopped now because when COVID-19 will pass, the silent pandemic cancer will continue beating us as one of the biggest social and sanitary problems we have to face in the world. In addition to the financial support that the non-governmental organization such as ours have been doing for cancer research in the last years to compensate the effects of the 2008 crisis, it is now absolutely necessary a strong investment effort and support on the side of public institutions and government in order to ensure the future of cancer research. This is the reason why we have asked 
the Spanish government, uh, a national cancer research plan, and we committed ourselves from the Spanish Association Against Cancer to work together with the, with the government on this national plan. The aim of this research plan is to double at least the investment made in cancer research in the previous 10 years and to ensure a stable framework for the researchers to enable them working on long-term basis. Last but not least, the COVID-19 pandemic has also shown the importance of international research uh, collaboration. Coordination of international networks will be a key factor to achieve results in cancer research. The European Union is working in this direction. Cancer Mission and Europe Horizon programs are a great opportunity to establish a common research strategy among the countries with a global objective of working all together for saving at least 3 million lives in Europe by the end of this decade. We must now spread in our countries and institutions the crucial importance of reinforcing cancer research as it is the only way to reduce the number of new cases of cancer, increase the survival and improving the quality of life of cancer patients. I would like to finish my words by saying that our common goal and is and will be to bring research results to all patients in order to ensure that all people will have equal access to prevention, diagnosis and treatments. As Dr. Rivas said, we must reach everybody. So thank you. Thank you, for, thank you very much for your remarks, Dr. Reyes, and thank you everyone that has been following us for this event during the last hour. It's been an incredible journey. We have gone from uh, the prevention and the EU strategy with uh, Dr. Wei the Pass, international collaboration and multidisciplinary teams with uh, Dr. Uh, Carolyn Dive, then a uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Andres Cervantes and Dr. Rivas, they have shared with us how do they think that is going to be the future and the effect of the immunotherapy and also the precision medicine. And of course, how Im what is the impact that COVID-19 has had in those low and middle income countries with uh, Dr. Uh, Satish Gopal. And of course, we get like the final thing that it was Dr. David Kerr with the, with the actual vaccine and how we all have to get vaccinated with the flu vaccine this year to avoid any, any other kind of, of damages. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been amazing. We have re really here demonstrated how there is no distance and no boundaries and that together we can beat cancer sooner. Thank you very much.